much, and it gives me great pleasure in presenting to you a portion of my PhD. I'm currently a lecturer at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa, and we're looking at cricket batting. Uh, but initially, we're looking at our first chapter, which is taking you through the modern era of cricket. How far has the game actually evolved? So firstly, if you look at Google, and if you have to type in the evolution of cricket, or just the modern era of cricket, you would find over 8 million results showing you about cricket. So the aim of this presentation is to simplify it a bit more, and from a scientific perspective, show how the great game has actually evolved over the years. So just to give you a brief history of the game, firstly, the game of cricket arrived in Australia as soon as colonization began in 1788, and that's when the laws of cricket as well was constituted. Cricket then continued between the 16th and 20th century, where the game was a common sport played for only passion and pure enjoyment, as we can see in these pictures derived over here after the 16th century. And then industries began to observe potential global opportunities through diversified business ventures in the game, as well as other global sports, and that's where the, the current games that we have played now has turned into a business, and from then on in the 18th century, that's where the game has started to evolve. Even though with, the, with regards to the cricket equipment, you can see the basic pictures with regards to the old cricket ball and the new cricket ball. And you, as you can see with the helmets, how that has evolved over time. So not just with regards to the game itself, but with regards to certain factors of the game of how that's involved in terms of equipment or in terms of its merchandise that it currently has. So mainly the cricket bat has evolved tremendously. And as you can see, the first cricket bat had started in 1720. And this was the last one in the early 1900s. And as you can see, that these bats are quite different as you move along the years. And the reason why this cricket bat was shaped as a hockey stick is because cricket was played when the ball was rolled on the ground. And thereafter, the ball, the ball was thrown under arm. And as the years evolved, it was then thrown over arm. So the bat had to basically correspond with how the games or the rules of the game had actually been constituted. So that's a cricket bat right now, and the top picture shows of how cricket bats are made in its different brands, and uh, how it's actually been influenced into the modern game. So that's basically a lot of the cricket bats that have come after the, the trees has been actually chopped, whether it's regards to Kashmir willow, English willow, and therefore carved and laminated in its respective ways. The challenge with this is that we need to save the trees, and part of my PhD right now is that we would like to see a cricket bat which is more sustainable, more productive, and in a lot of the matches you see how many of the cricket bats have actually been broken. So we're trying to even focus towards less breaking of the bats. So looking at something where it can save the trees, and something which is more productive and perhaps more lighter. So I urge you to watch the space, because in December 2015, we are going to unravel the new cricket bat. It looks like hood, but it is not hood. I cannot disclose it right now, but Maybe if you're at the next conference, you will then see, hopefully, that will change the world for cricket batting and that it's more sustainable and we can save as many trees as you can. So not just with the bats, but evolution of batting has been tremendous over the years as well. And uh, if you can remember with regards to the first um, coaching book that came out in 1954, that was the MCC coaching manual. Before 1954, a lot of the batsmen were uncoached and were playing the ball on its merit. When the MCC coaching manual came out in 1954, they encouraged the players to play with a straight bat because they, they felt that if the back lift of the bat is faced directly backwards, it will come down straight as well. Well, we did an uh, in evaluation on the back lift technique in cricket and does the practice of elite cricketers in the last century follow the theory? And you would see that a lot of the different types of batting techniques with cricketers have been different. Firstly, with the guard of cricket, Don Bradman, Brian Lara and Tenduka, you can see that their back lifts are quite distinctive and very different. So what we found is that a loop technique was actually making the successful uh, batsman more successful in the last century, where a straight back technique was actually limiting players in terms of following through, and also limiting them from going from franchise level cricket to international cricket. So these are the classifiers. So we looked at three classifiers. The top of the bat facing fairly straight back or towards the slips, about 0 to 25 degrees. The second classifier, the top of the bat facing between second slip in gully between 25 and 45 degrees. 
and the top of the bat facing between gully and backward point, which was between 45 and 80 degrees. And what we have found that a considerable amount of players between that century, about 50 or 60 percent of more in both Test cricket and ODI cricket, had actually done the third classifier, where a minority had actually done between the classifier one and classifier two. And the take-home message for this is that what is actually advocated in coaching manuals does not happen does not happen in actual play with the elite cricket batsmen. And then the Bodyline series had started in 1932 and 1933. And the Bodyline series was in, instrumental in the history of the game because they uh, started the, his, the, the history of the leg slip theory, the leg dominant theory. And one of the bowlers in that time, Lodro, was a, was a pioneer of the, of the Bodyline series at that time. And as you can see with these fielders is that they have a leg slip a few fields on the leg side and a 45 uh, degree fielder and a lot of the fielders were predominant on the leg side because they were aggressive in the attack to actually promote the batsman or to actually intimidate the batsman so that they can actually pull or get caught in the slips and this was actually the leg side theory and as you can see a few of the batsmen had actually got injured so the question to you is is that if the body line series had started in 1932 to 1933 and as the game went on to the 1970s when were helmets started? Because we even did a retrospective analysis on certain batsmen, and we found that batsmen before 1954, when they weren't wearing helmets, actually left less balls and were hitting more balls. When the helmets started, they started to leave more balls than hitting the balls, especially in test cricket. So the question to you is, when the helmets started in the 1970s and 80s, has helmets increased the passivity of the game? Has it made batting more passive than without the helmet? So safety is one aspect. Passivity is another aspect. And that's just something to think about. So if you even look at the modern performance in science in cricket, optimizing performances and forecasting frameworks for injury prevention has been the epitome of cricket science, especially with fast bowlers because of back injuries. And considerable amounts of research have shown that the range of involvements in the cricket sciences have just gone on. So examples of such studies include results from Ferdinand et al. from the uh, University of Sydney in Australia, and he suggested that a large proportion of fast bowlers may get a high risk of lumbar injury, which is a back injury, from the use of the mixed action bowling technique. So there were three bowling techniques, the front-on, the side-on, and the mixed-on. Lately, the authors had mentioned that it would be advisable to recommend the semi-open action as an alternative to the front-on action bowling technique, because this minimizes injury prevention. And then currently, biomechanists and cricket scientists have classified the bowling action techniques into more than several different types. So it's not just the three techniques, it, they have now classified it into more than several different types. Which poses a challenge for modern day coaches to translate what exactly should be prescribed for bowlers. And this is what was said at the Cricket Congress in Sydney, Australia earlier this year. And more than 10 years ago, from a performance perspective, Noakes et al. had discussed that the physiological requirements for cricketers had concluded that the fitness of cricketers may be increased. However, their risk of injury can also be reduced by more specific eccentric exercise training programs. So the way forward now in cricket research requires that main elements such as performance prevention and psychology in cricket to be formed as one holistic systematical model. And rehabilitation specialists such as physical therapists, physiotherapists and biokineticists are more concerned with the area of overloads and injury prevention associated with bowlers where scientists are concerned with the lack of training efficiency for batsmen due to the increased risk of injury sustained by bowlers. So the challenge that we have now in cricket science is that performance and prevention are not talking to each other. So we're focusing more of prevention in terms of cricket bowlers especially, but a lack of training for batsmen because of these injured bowlers, and these two are not talking to each other, and therefore this is a need for future cricket science. And then cricket technology has also evolved tremendously as the game has evolved. And as we can see, a camera and video footage, these bells which come on with the light, that has been tremendous in showing us if there's a run up or not. The wagon wheel um, giving us a physical or physics description of what happens with the leg before wicket and even with regards to the hawk eye. So cricket technology and innovation has really evolved. So the cricket technology verdict do you think technology has made us think less? Because before technology has evolved, players had to do a lot of homework and research before the game was played. So the question to you is, has it actually made us think less, or has it been an advantage of us? 
the advantage of this is, is that it's very crucial and it, it helps the umpires considerably with regards to seeing if the players have been out or not. The disadvantage is that players are actually thinking less and are relying a lot on technology to assist them. And the thinking sportsman has shown to be actually a much more proficient sportsman, not just with playing, but even with thinking as well. So that's just a question to you again to think about. So technology can assist us in various ways. However, we need to be careful of how it is used. And it would therefore prove interesting to see how past cricketers who didn't have technology, particularly batsmen, who would have benefited of progress with current technology, resources and equipment that are currently made available to the modern cricketers right now. Another factor that has influenced the modern game is the player's time away from home. So before, cricket was played as a pure enjoyment and for passion. Right now, the rapid involvement of the game, cricketers in the 21st century are faced with overwhelming commitments, and one of these is playing cricket for 11 months in a year, which equates to more than 280 days away from their family because it's their career. And therefore, as the demand of the players' contrast increase, their commitments and performance levels from players also increase, and this can also precipitate players at an increased risk for injury. So they've had, uh, they probably have international cricket council tournament more, once in two years or once in four years. They have the IPL in the Champions League every year. They've got their tests of cricket fixtures every year. They've got their one-day international, their T20 cricket fixtures every year. And then they, some of them even consider playing overseas, so either cold pack here in county in England, or going to the Big Bash in Australia, or even in South Africa or abroad. So it's become an 11 month commitment for a lot of modern day cricketers. So that's a question to ask. So ultimately, it has been a cricket revolution. And as you can see from stadium to stadium, that has changed considerably a lot. In terms of the cricket ball, the cricket bat has changed a lot. In terms of the wickets, that was pure hood. Now we've got the metal wickets with the light on. In terms of the players, in terms of promotion, now we've got window dressing. So that has been a change as well. And then cricket helmets has changed considerably. So this is one of the first helmets that has been made in England. And the contingency with this is that with the, the, the visor of the helmet and with the grill is that it's not hard enough. So the ball can still pierce be, uh, through the gap and some players can still get injured. This helmet has been made for two things. Shock absorption and more air for the player to breathe with the head and also for the grill and for the visor to be so intact with aluminium that the ball cannot go through. So that's the latest helmet that is all involved right now. Okay. So even with cricket being playing as enjoyment, now it's an industry-driven business-making scheme. The, the, it's not really a scheme, but it's actually it's industry and it's business-driven. And then what was known as a gentleman's game has now turned out to be an entrepreneur's game. And a lot of the T20 matches, you'll see a lot of the cheerleaders, which kind of, you know, uh, substitutes the idea of a gentleman's game. And a, a cricket that was played for six months in the year is a season, is now 11 months in the season. And as you can see the picture with Don Bradman, the boundary was used as the gates. Those white gates were actually used as a boundary in a lot of the stadiums. Now what's happened is that the ropes is pushed back in for about two meters, so which means that the bats are much more powerful and the ropes, the, the boundaries are much more shorter which makes it a predominantly more for batsman's game, which makes it easier for them to score more runs. And that has evolved as well with the boundary. So in conclusion, could one postulate that such advancements are contributing to the overload and injury risk of players? Or could we say that such questions that the modern game and technology are actually assisting the cricketers in playing better? We could also ask how far we have really come in the cricketing world, or has all facets since the game's inception become institutionalized to a business model? And these are the fundamental questions which need to be addressed in conjunction with drafting and implemented implementation of legislations, policies, education, and ethical considerations. And this can even be driven up from the International Cricket Council, which is the ICC. And lastly, these legislations education will ensure that there is an equilibrium of effective transitions and management not only for the players, but also for the credibility of this beautiful game for cricket. Thank you very much.